The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Access for Wayne, the Allen County Public Library, or any other supporting groups. If you'd like to produce a show, call us at 260-421-1250. Hello, welcome to my show. My name is Patty Hunter. My show is Patty's Page TV Show. Today in our home studio, our special guest is Martin Carba. He's the Indiana State Representative of District 81. Wow, that seems to be a whole big place there, you know. <laughs> so welcome to my show. Well, thanks for having me, Patty. Oh, you got a good grip. Nice, uh, nice to be here. So, yeah, the 81st district is, uh, it shouldn't be a big place compared to the other districts because we're supposed to represent one one hundredth of the state. Mm -hmm. There are 100 reps, and um, uh, I've been a state rep since uh, 2012. I ran against Wynn Moses and defeated him. Wynn Moses, I've That's seen right. him. I met him one time. Yeah, so have I. Oh, um, right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, so I've been serving since then. Uh, every time we do a census in the country, we yeah. have to redraw the lines. And so this next election will be the first election on the new district maps. Why do they change it? Is it every 10 years or something? Or? Yeah, it's every 10 years. And it has to do with population shifts. So going back to how I started, we're supposed to represent one one hundredth of the mm -hmm. state. Mm -hmm. And so we draw the lines based on where people live mm -hmm. at that time. Well, great example, part of my new territory, when we redraw the lines again in 10 years, <laughs> uh, we know we're going to probably have more population in my district than not because of all the growth in Huntertown. That's now going to be a oh, part of the 81st. Huntertown is getting bigger. So when you think about the um, movement of people over 10 years, it can be dramatic. And so some areas around the state we saw a decline in um, population. Mm -hmm. In other areas we saw great uh, increases in population and so we have to even all that out so that I'm not representing 60,000 people and my representative to my left or right is representing 80,000 and so that's we do it in conjunction with the census. So you even it up. That's right. <laughs> we're getting we're getting back to square for now. It's like fluctuating you know Breathing, you don't know. Oh my <laughs> God, that's a <the> boundary. <laughs> so, uh, what are the uh, touch points of your boundary? Uh, from so, where to what? So, the 81st district now, um, the west border is going to be the county line. The northern border is going to be the county line. The east side will be Tonkel. And there's a little carve out, again, just population wise, you got to shift the line somewhere. Yeah. But basically, um, Tonkle down to Union Chapel and over, and then if you know La Cabrera subdivision, mm. it's on the, the line is on the west side of that, so La Cabrera is not in, but on the west side to the county line is, down to DuPont, and then DuPont back over to Auburn and Clinton. My southern borders are Coliseum Boulevard, jogs down and catches Bass Road to the county line. So... Simply said, Northwest Allen County. I would hope so. <clears throat> but those are the specific lines that we have now. How many miles is that? I'm not sure about oh, the mileage, but the but the geographic there. territory of my district increased. Oh, yeah. uh, certainly, and obviously our population as a state increased, so everyone's districts um, from where they were uh, ten years ago went up a little bit in population. So you became. Uh, State rep ten years ago, twenty twelve. What uh, role of a Indiana state representative does? In your 
district? So as a state representative, we consider uh, laws, tax code, all those sorts of things. Now specifically, my roles in the General Assembly are my committee assignments. I'm chair of the Insurance and Financial Institutions Committee. Mm -hmm. I've always, since I got elected, sat on the Labor and Pensions Committee. Mm -hmm. And um, now, for the last two years, I'm on the Education Committee. So prior to that, I'd served on uh, Economic Development and Small Business, and mm -hmm. prior to that, Veterans and Public Safety Committees. But now, Education, Insurance and Financial Institutions, and Labor and Pensions. That all? That's, that, those are the three. It keeps me busy. It keeps you out of trouble, too. <laughs> so what do you do every day when you're not in session? When I'm not in session, I'm a financial advisor and mm. an insurance advisor. Have we got a question for you? <laughs> we, um, uh, I work together uh, with a partner at Financial Focus, um, and uh, he and I uh, are licensed the same, securities and insurance license, but um, he is a certified financial planner, so he takes more of the investment role with clients. Mm. I take more of the insurance protection role although we both know each other's uh, businesses. So we, we really work together to plan for our clients' futures. So for everything all rolled up in one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I do a fair amount of health insurance work as well. I have a health insurance company that partners with Financial Focus called uh, Heartland Health Insurance Advisors. I heard of that. And uh, uh, we do a lot of Medicare insurance and a lot of individual insurance, and, and uh, we have some small group insurance as well. That's good. That's good. So education and COVID, how in the world can the kids catch up in learning their lessons in order to pass their grades? Now that's a, that's a big question and it's going to be a team effort. We did in the last budget uh, allocate more money for learning loss. Um, you know, my hope is that we've, we've learned through all this that um, in-person education just can't be replaced. Um, in fact, this year we had a bill that uh, will limit the number of e-learning days mm. unless there is an extenuating Another, circumstance yeah. that gets approved. Um, but really limiting those to three days unless the instruction is just like it would be in a classroom. In other words, the teacher is teaching the full day of classes. Mm -hmm. We will allow for that um, because that compared to e-learning is kind of two different things. And having the kids pay attention when they're doing e-learning, right. they get all distracted and everything like that. And what we've seen, some kids really excelled with it, but mm. many and most have struggled. Needs. Yeah, and Needs. so we've uh, we've tried to put some money behind uh, programs that the local schools can develop to try to make up some of that learning loss. Mm -hmm. So what if COVID strikes again? Do you have to wear masks at the kids? So far, we have um, left the masking decision up to local schools. Mm. Um, you know, I'm personally uh, not in favor of forced masks. I, I think if a parent wants to send their kid to school with a mask, they ought to have, be able to sure. do that. Sure, embarrassing. Um, but we, we've seen too much about how masks don't actually help. Um, they don't? They, they, they don't from the standpoint of, we don't use them properly. You know, a surgeon will say, well, I use the mask in surgery, they work. Mm. They do, but then they're immediately thrown away. You know, they don't touch them and mess with them. And that's where the germ spread, I think, actually can be worse, so. I came down with COVID two, three times in three years. And I wore a mask when I ever went out, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I, Nothing's foolproof. I mean, no. that's one thing that we've learned through this whole thing is that, um, you know, it, it affects different people different ways. Yeah. And, um, you know, the vaccine doesn't prevent you from getting it, contrary to what they oh, tried the to Lord sell. For that. Um, you know, we, we think that it has made it um, less severe for many people. Um, Which I'm glad, because I, I landed in hospital a couple of times with this. Yeah. And they gave me an infusion. Last time, was a couple months ago, wasn't it? Yeah, a couple months ago. Uh, three days of infusion, an hour and a half each. Wow. I've heard those infusions have been really, they saved really my revolutionary. Life. They saved my life. Yeah, the therapeutics are so much better now than they were at the beginning of the pandemic in the year mm -hmm. 2000. My hats off to the 
people who are saving people's lives, the fire people, the police, as well as nurses and doctors. Absolutely. Thank God for them. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. Under the Lord's supervision, of course. <laughs> Always. Employment. Hmm. People are still not working. Are they going back to work or what? You know, we, we have a lot of jobs um, that are open right now. You talk to, I don't really care what employer, um, from uh, the smallest of employers to the largest of employers, mm -hmm. and there are job openings. Um, I think what we've seen, and I've started to see some studies suggest that you have two things that have come from the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. One, uh, many people, when they were just told to stay at home, had the time to figure out, well, when can I retire? Mm -hmm. And I think some folks found out they could retire a lot sooner than they realized just mm -hmm. because the day-to-day -day work kept you away from planning it. So you had more people retire. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also you you do find fewer women are in the workforce. Hey, why not? Well, I think kids. I think kids. And the cost of daycare versus what you can potentially make at a job mm -hmm. and when you factor in the other non-monetary is that time with those kids that you get to have. I think many women have decided that they're going to do the stay-at-home mom thing at least while the kids are young. And they can learn, they can work on their computers, whatever. And there's, there's more of that too. There's more self-employment through technology. Um, so I just think um, I think we're just evolving a lot with technology. Yeah, we are. And I think... Into what? Well, that, that's yet to be seen, but uh, technology is what you make it. It can be great and it can be really detrimental. And, um, and so I think all those factors are, are, are putting us in this situation where we have all these jobs. Um, quite frankly, it's a worker's market because there are so many openings. We see wages going up. Mm -hmm. oh. It doesn't take government raising minimum wage for wages to go up. The competition yeah. is fierce for mm -hmm. workers and good workers at that. And we need education for these workers. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. What percentage of people have lost their jobs? And how many companies had to close because of COVID? You know? I don't know those percentages. Um, well, I, I know that... Uh, I know that the um, the PPP loans that the federal government did underneath Trump saved so many jobs for them to be able to and companies to be able to withstand the shutdowns. Um, here again, I hope we've learned some lessons on on the shutdowns. I mean, we've seen um, you know Indiana was shut, but not near to the extent of Michigan and Illinois and I mean California, the coasts. And, and Canada to this day remains limited in scope. Yeah. And, um, and you can see all the, the rebellion up there with their, their trucker rally and all that. Um, Only a little much, do <laughs> Well, I think they have reason to be. Um, We're Canadian. It's one, um, it's one thing to be cautious. I think everybody wants to proceed with caution when you're in the middle of a pandemic. But it's another thing for top-down control, and I think that's where we're seeing so much pushback, um, you know, across the country and across the world in many cases. We were given, uh, what is that we got, 1,200 whatever, uh, what's that word? Stimulus checks? St yes. Yes. Do we have to pay taxes for that? I don't believe so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, um... Still That's right? good, and it feels good at the time, but, but, but you know, if you look at our national debt and mm -hmm. you look at our deficits, they are um, on an unsustainable growth rate, in my opinion, and um, at some point, we're all going to have to come to terms with what, what our future is going to be, financially speaking. Oh. Well, I don't know how we are, but, uh, this whole country, but how's Indiana doing? Indiana, we have ourselves in a very good spot. Um, uh, taxpayers this year um, mm -hmm. are getting automatic taxpayer refund. I believe it's $125 a person. And uh, should have come on your tax return. Oh, I didn't bring it with me. Um, <laughs> but um, 
so we have that. We, we voted to cut taxes. We're phasing mm. down to the lowest income tax rate in the country of states that have an income tax, which oh. I believe there's 42 that have an income tax. So we'll be the lowest when it phases mm. down. I hope to accelerate that next year. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we have a surplus, you know, and, and sometimes we get cur criticized for having a surplus because, you know, schools want more money, many programs, ev every program comes to the Ways and Means Committee wanting more money, and that's understandable in some ways, but that responsible Republican management of the budget, having that savings account, when we went through COVID, mm. schools did not take a cut. They, they, they got the same money that we budgeted. Mm. Um, and so part of the reason why we were able to do that is because we responsibly held money back in savings mm -hmm. for those downturns. Yes. We know periodically there's going to be a downturn. There's going to be a recession. Well, we experienced a forced immediate recession almost we in 2020. We had Everybody was scared of this COVID. That's right. So, so we have those reserves. It helped us get through. And then because of our business climate and everything that we've done to make Indiana an attractive state for businesses to run, we've recovered so much faster than many, many states around okay. the country. So right I feel great about that. Um, and that's why we it? see all those job openings and, and um, people getting back to work. Uh, you are pro-life. 100%. And you have a promo a commercial, what is it, for your campaigning? Right. And our dear friend, Monica Kelsey, she's in it. She was... Uh, she kind of tells her story in that You commercial. bet. And she's... He did, you did a good job with the safe haven baby boxes. Thank you. You did a good job. And I, I, I filmed her first one, what she put in at Woodburn. Oh, yeah? I filmed it. I can send it to you. The first show. I'd love to see that. Yeah. So, um, what else would you like to talk about? I mean, what do you see in the future? Um, I think we see, I see, especially, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the committee work that I do. Sure. Um, I see in the education space uh, much more push. We push this year um, uh, a bill to really empower parents more in the classroom oh, yes. and in the, in the kids' education. Um, we had a bill, House Bill 1134, that passed out of the House that would have created a curriculum committee with 60% parents, 40% teachers. It would have given access, and many schools do provide access to curriculum, but some don't around the state. So mm. curriculum access um, was a part of that. Um, when it comes to SEL and uh, social-emotional learning, oh. that... Uh, schools would have to have parental consent before they, should. Before they, they provide those services. Um, and uh, third party surveys would have to be opted into. Uh, parents would have to approve those before their kids take them. There's so many things out there that I think many folks are unaware of in terms of what's being done in the schools. And I'm being on education now just for the last two years mm -hmm. are becoming more and more aware. Ex aware and exposed to those things. And it's a great concern to me. Um, so that house bill we passed out with strong language for parents protecting children. We sent that to the Senate. The Senate heard complaints from mm -hmm. the ISTA and Indiana State Teachers Association um, and, and others uh, about it. And they basically stripped the bill down mm -hmm. to not much of anything, yes. passed it back to us. Now, we have a process in the legislature called conference committee where we can, what's called dissent on the changes. We can say we don't like the changes to this bill. Um, so then you can, can put together a conference committee of people mm -hmm. uh, to work out the differences. Oh, um, that's good. So unfortunately this oh. year, our Senate colleagues refused to work on any of the differences. And so... Um, we weren't willing to pass a basically a do nothing watered down bill into law because it did nothing. We'd rather come back and fight for good policy uh, next year. So we need to help our kids. I mean, right. some of the stuff that they're showing in public schools from kindergarten and up, or maybe pre K. It's disturbing. There were things brought into the committee 
um, again, that um, I, I had not seen before, um, but graphic uh, cartoon images, but almost as bad or worse, uh, designed for these kids showing sexual their, acts. Breaking down their inhibition. Yes, and so um, it's just horrifying stuff. You know, the opposition said, oh, we just want to ban books and burn books. And it's, you know, yeah, we want to ban books that are totally inappropriate for kids. Mm. Um, uh, and it was just as simple as putting them in. There's another bill about the book specifically, just putting them in their own adult section or an older where section kids where kids can get them. And that was met with a lot of resistance. So what, what, what? there's a real... Um, Why? I mean, I... Dang, if I know what's going on in this world. I I think, and this is a little bit of my Christian faith coming out, but yeah. um, I just think it's it's evil taking the devil hold. It's, it's the devil at work, and it's evil taking hold in our communities and mm -hmm. confusing people. I mean, Satan's a great deceiver, and I yeah. think that that's what's happening right now. They're taking the prayer and Jesus out of the high schools, public schools. So what comes in? Garbage. Right. And the teachers don't know any better. They, they just go about what they're told to do, whether they like it or not, right? They can't well, and, and, and some of them don't go down that path. And mm. I was talking with somebody actually just yesterday about a, a lot of this kind of stuff and what's going on and how do these programs even get started. Yeah. Well, the challenge is the programs don't start as hey, let's get pornographic books into the they, hands of kids. Sort of There's no program voted on for that. Yeah. Um, or let's, you know, groom kids through these various services. But they're passed for good reason. So social-emotional learning on the surface. Yes. Um, it's what I'm kids in. come into our schools, and you talk to any teacher, mm -hmm. there are kids in every classroom that have social-emotional problems. Mm -hmm. And they don't always have a lot of support at home. And that's a real challenge. And so they rely on the teachers. That inevitably, the, the schools and teachers will come to us. They see the problems. They want to be empowered to try to help. And so on the surface, it makes sense. It's for the kids. You know, that's the excuse for a lot of things. It's for the kids. And maybe even at the beginning starts out good. Mm. that they're trying to they address those out. programs. Yeah, but unfortunately, those programs can then be morphed and used for bad purposes. And I think so many of government's programs at various times can start with very good intentions and end up going down a bad path. And when it does, that's when we have to be there to rein it in yeah. and, and make sure that that stuff doesn't happen. Well, I noticed that uh, with me being with Lutherans for Life, we have found out that Planned Parenthood is in schools and teaching them about sex education. Yeah, it's horrible. I mean, that, that's part of this thing that you're fighting. That's right. That's right. But we need, uh, I'll use an analogy, we need a dance partner with the Senate. In order to pass a bill, it has to pass both houses, and then we have to have a governor willing to sign it. Mm -hmm. um, which, you know, didn't work. that didn't work for one bill, although we're going to override that veto. Uh, I promise you that on May 24th. Okay. Can't wait for that. So, um, yeah, it, it's, um, it's a, the, the lawmaking process is intentionally um, laborious and difficult, and that's a good thing most of the time. But when you have these problems that all of a sudden the you need to fires. fix quick, um, it can be tough if not everybody's aware or willing. Some of the stuff is so outrageous, the initial reaction is, that, no, on, can't that can't happen. But that can't is. happen. I met with a parents group down in, uh, in Indianapolis um, learning about this stuff for the first time about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. And they brought pictures in from the school where kids are wearing, like, they, they call them, like, furry masks or whatever. I don't pretend to know all this stuff, but it, it literally had a horse's head mask, was being taught by a separate teacher and its own <laughs> table, and it'd be funny if it wasn't sad, it's but sad. they, yeah, they allow this child to identify as a horse. Um, it, 
it's just we've gotten so far away from truth is truth, and we have to we have to get to a get point where we come together. back to the fact that there are certain universal truths. That we don't truth. have to agree on everything beyond that, but there are yeah. certain things. Logic. There's boys and girls, and yes. in very rare cases, people are born with with both. Um, uh, I know both uh, things. So God, it's yeah. just <sighs> frustrating. It's very. It? It's frustrating, but it's also it's it's saddening. It's it saddens me because I know that folks are hurting and they're being led sense. astray and they're being hurt by all that. You know, I'm glad you are in politics. Thank you. Oh, good grief. <laughs> what would you like to say to my audience just before we go? Well, I just. Uh, tell you to have a great day and obviously if this airs before the election and you live in my district I'd love to have your vote <laughs> on May 3rd and uh, just thank you so much Patty for having me on this has been a, a nice time I thank you it's been a great time talking with you too you make a lot of sense I, I must say so well, thank you very much so this is Patty Hunter with Martin Cabo so uh, we'll see you next week so, well, God bless you. Safe journey and safe week, and good day. Always for the rest of all our